Patrick Henningsen talks on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. All right, welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to TNT, today's, today's News Talk. Uh, it's great to have you back and, you know, a wonderful discussion with our previous guest, Miles of Truth. Uh, we, we touched on some really important issues. The uh, vaccine issue, of course, is still looming large in everybody's mind. We're absolutely being inundated with all sorts of stories and the healthcare industry is pushing these harder than ever. Uh, but the other story which you brought up, which I think was very interesting, was the Ukrainian agricultural land and the foreign ownership of it. And why is that significant? Perhaps we'll discuss uh, the issue of Ukraine later in this hour with our next guest. Uh, he is a geopolitical analyst and he's also uh, have he has a platform called the New Resistance on Telegram, which I highly recommend at New Resistance. Go to Telegram. That's definitely one of the places you want to be for sort of up to the minute uh, information and analysis on Ukraine, but also all things international. Ashley. His name is Joaquin Flores, joining us on the line right now. Hello, Joaquin. Hey, man. How's it going? Thanks for having me on. No, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, Joaquin's also based in Belgrade in Serbia. And the main topic of our discussion today uh, is going to be the Balkans. And if you were watching the news over the last week, you'll know that the issue of Kosovo uh, in Serbia has come up. Uh, there's a little bit of a uh, potential situation there. It seems to have been diffused for now. Um, but Joaquin has uh, been looking at this for many years, and uh, he's very well placed to give us a little bit of a background. Now, first of all, Joaquin, the issue of Kosovo, you know, for people who are listening who are maybe not familiar with, you know, how Yugoslavia was broken up um, during the 1990s and the significance of that, you know, why it happened, how it happened, and, and what it means right now. Uh, if, you, if you could give us a little bit of a, a background on this um, for, for those of us who are, might be a little rusty on this topic. Yeah, well, I guess it's like, uh, and thanks again. It's a great question. I think you're. I think that's the way to sort of introduce it. Well, in a nutshell, you had a state called Yugoslavia, which after had been a kingdom, and then afterwards, after World War II, uh, became like a socialist federation, like a socialist republic. It was kind of like a miniature USSR. But what was very different about it is that it um, it was actually put together out of these different other sort of uh, statelets or nationalities or peoples that didn't all, you know, this concept of Yugoslavia was kind of new or it was, you know, it was in, it was like a 19th century thing from, you know, pan-Slavism. So people on the ground considered themselves to be, you know, uh, Bosnian or, you know, Muslim Bosnian, or they consider themselves to be Serbian or Croatian or Macedonian and, you know, Slovenian. And that continued on. And even in Yugoslavia, it was divided up among those different states, which today are all independent countries and or uh, regions or there's some contest. And these have basically broken up in a process in starting in the 90s uh, and carrying on until about 2008. And um, so really quite recently, you know, we're not talking about ancient history. The 90s is far back enough for some, but 2008 is relatively, uh, you know, we're just talking about 14 years ago. And so, you know, the one of the issues and this is something that's debated. I want to, you know, full disclosure, this is something that's debated hotly among scholars. And there's a lot of national sort of uh, fervor right behind whenever you talk about you know, the politics of uh, the Central and West Balkans, right, Patrick? So, mm -hmm. you know, I always introduce it just sort of saying I'm aware of, of that. And that there's, you know, uh, different, we should say, uh, legal historical facts of the record that are accepted in different camps. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you don't always have like a consensus in the sense of what's two plus two. Uh, so there's a lot of narratives going on, right? And effectively but just my sense of it um not being born of any of those uh not that part of the world you know being a uh hispanic chicano mexican-american guy from los angeles you know i don't i don't have skin in game at the beginning of this looking at you know the, the story but i've been looking at it since the conflict began 
I was in, you know, university at the time, uh, you know, with uh, Yugoslavia when the U.S. was involved in, you know, 99. So um, with the bombing of Belgrade. So, you know, many people would disagree and that said, I would say that the issue with Yugoslavia and its what the state and the kind of the origins of its breaking up was really in the agreement of, with the with that the uh, West that would become NATO made with the Soviets on like a couple different countries, and one of them was Italy, and another one was Yugoslavia. And you know, even though it was like the partisan movement in Italy that kind of made things happen, you also had the American you know uh, invasion from the south, right? So you kind of have this are the Americans going to sort of appoint the next government or is it going to be the what? And so the Italian case led to one conspiracy theory. And then this with Yugoslavia, uh, you know, even though it nominally at first seems to be like it's going to be part of this sort of Soviet sphere of influence. And even though it retained this sort of um, Marxist Leninist ideology, they were very quickly Western oriented and had open trade and open passport regime and no cold war at all. Uh, between Yugoslavia and, you know, the Western NATO countries. People would get, you know, people could buy those Yugo cars. Remember those POS cars yeah, made yeah. by Zastava? You know, everybody needs a Yugo sometimes, you know. Uh, that was the old, uh, you know, uh, slogan. And uh, it was a, it was a sort of a, people considered like a mixed economy and maybe even like the best of both worlds and stuff like that between East and West. And in terms of an intelligence and entry, like Belgrade was like the spy capital of the world. You have all these, all the like James Bond movies in the sixties have these scenes in Belgrade and stuff. So you have uh, this sort of, this kind of context of the cold war and Yugoslavia kind of playing both sides. Right. And uh, the trouble it got into ultimately and the kind of the issues that rose, the opportunity to act, obviously the Soviet union had collapsed under Gorbachev. So, you know, it, it precluded the possibility of Yugoslavia having a Russian partner, especially because you have Yeltsin in charge, right? Mm -hmm. So geopolitically, they were kind of cornered. Since the 70s, there had been an agreement, at, you know, from the Club of Rome through the Vatican and through NATO channels and the Anglo-Saxons of, of the transatlanticists and through the Vatican to activate um, different groups in Yugoslavia and the, you know their their agents and stuff like that, and then to use for the you know regular processes, political processes. Again, this is the absence of the Soviet Union, right? To use the IMF and like lending structures and this kind of Washington consensus uh, monopolarity on on the uh, financial front dominate the agenda. So you kind of they kind of sort of were responsible. For, the Western powers were responsible for having Milosevic come into power. They were responsible for having um, different among the the Croatian, Slovenian, and you know Bosnian, Croatian and Bosnian uh, Muslim constituents. Different leaders that were going to be the more kind of standoffish with each other had all kind of come out of similar backing structures. Very interestingly, right? Mm -hmm. And so. When Tito died in the early 80s, there was a power vacuum. He kind of didn't appoint who was going to replace him. And so what happened at the end of the day was you just kind of were – the country was run by committees that represented these different ethnic constituencies. And at a certain point, um, Milosevic makes a gambit to kind of run his own kind of color revolution schemes in each of the constituent republics to kind of create – to seize power again as Yugoslavia to kind of centralize things. And it succeeds a little here, fails a little there, and it's part of a series of events which ultimately sees um, NATO uh, forces ultimately backing all sides but the Serbs. But I wanted to be clear that at the very beginning, Milosevic was kind of part of the agenda too. But through those experiences and through that event, it kind of flipped him, obviously kind of flipped in the other direction. People look at what happened with Assad or people kind of even look at um, when the U.S. directly appoints you know, people in power in other countries, usually the weight of the local situation over time, that gravity kind of flips them in the direction of sovereignty many times, you know, more than not. So, I mean, that's just been my observation in, in the field and my studies, but that's sort of the long and short of how, you know, Yugoslavia broke apart. It was really a plan in the wet hatched by the West to divide it up and then reap all the, you know, economic stuff, the privatization, selling off, whatever, dividing it, keeping it kind of into internecine rivalry for the coming decades. Yeah, because a lot of people would 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 think that 
they needed to be broken up because it was just too strong of a of a state Yugoslavia right on Europe's doorstep just as the EU was coming into uh, mature into its current form uh, it was just that and also the fact that it tr- uh, led by Serbia traditionally would be allied I guess with with Russia um, that's also was seen as probably a threat I would imagine uh, yeah I mean just in in 30 seconds it was um, even though under you know the Tito period, the Serbs dominated a lot of the federal military and, and intelligence services. You know, um, Tito did a lot of things to contain to not treat the Serbs as like one of the nationalities in the full sense. They were kind of adopting this Austro-Marxist idea that the Serbs were the oppressors. So even though the Serbs dominated and caused re- some resentment among the national constituencies, like you know Bosnian uh, Muslim Bosnians or Croatians, etc. Um, nevertheless, you know, Tito wasn't running things in Serbia's interest, but in that power vacuum, then it became a, you know, a, a fecal show. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we'll pick this thread up on the other side. I'm here with Joaquin Flores from the New Resistance. We're talking about uh, the former Yugoslavia, and we'll be getting into Serbia and Kosovo on the other side. Why is the Balkan region still pivotal? We'll find out after these messages. You should hear what Joseph Arthur is talking about. He was talking about the white hats are really in control, a.k.a. the supposed good guys that are going to, like, save the day from all this. And this is all just, uh, you know, a political theater to, to reveal the real intentions of the evil ones. And that the white hats are the ones responsible for putting in such ridiculous uh, candidates for president and vice president in these times. Because if you think about it, it really just couldn't get much more ridiculous than these two. I mean, they and they were both unelectable until they weren't. I mean, Kamala was out of the scene and then she wasn't. You know what I mean? So what do you guys think of that? Do you think it's a white hat, black hat thing? Do you believe in that stuff? I mean, it it really could be none worse than Biden and Kamala, really. I mean, it is ridiculous. Joseph Arthur and his Technicolor Dreamcast on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Affordable housing, we can build that. Sustainable housing, we can build that. At MIT Modular, we understand the importance of housing for all and the importance of design, cost, and functionality. Our goal is to meet the needs of our growing population by converting shipping containers to livable units. If you're like-minded and in a position to invest in something meaningful and life-changing, we want to hear from you. We are a team of professional architects, engineers, and financial and tax experts dedicated to offering unique solutions that provide a brighter future. Our Opportunity Zone Fund offers investors both real estate and operating business diversification, five-year tax deferral on capital gains, annual tax benefits, and ultimately tax-free appreciation potential. There are Opportunity Zones all over America. If you're interested in learning more about our services, need affordable housing, or want to participate in creating a new vision for tomorrow, give us a call in the U.S. on 385-985-5702 or read more at MITModular.com. MIT Modular. We can build that. Bullets are not shot at us from the barrels of guns. Poisons are shot into us from the barrels of syringes. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to TNT. Today's news talk, we're cruising into the second hour of this live broadcast. And remember, if you missed any of the live broadcasts, you can pick up the archives uh, anytime after the show. Just go to tntradio.live, look at any of the hosts, and you'll see their drop-down archive will appear below. And also, we're on every single podcasting platform, iTunes, Podbeam, uh, tune in app, Spotify, iHeartRadio, w- whatever you subscribe to, you'll be able to find your favorite uh, TNT host and you'll find any of the guest segments as well. It's well organized. It's a great service for the listeners and it means, it, quite frankly, you can listen at your leisure and so many of our listeners do while they're actually working and doing stuff. They're listening to TNT, something you can do on this network that you can't necessarily do with YouTube, which you have to be watching and not necessarily only listening. But uh, we're going to be joined uh, right now by our guest, uh, Joaquin Flores from the New Resistance. And before the break, uh, Joaquin was explaining to us the background of Yugoslavia, how it came to be, and then the process of it 
uh, breaking up. And and Joaquin, uh, the the breakup of Yugoslavia with the help of NATO, um, it created uh, some new states and one in particular that's not really recognized um, as a state by all of its neighbors. It's called Kosovo. How did this plan uh, come to be? You know, this isn't it's an autonomous region. It's some people called a country. Explain to us the status of Kosovo. Yeah, it's a Kosovo is a region of Serbia that Serbia considers to be part of Serbia and does not recognize beyond an autonomous republic and then um, or an autonomous uh, region. And then you have uh, Kosovo, it's the, the government that um, parties have to talk to, like by, you know, um, de facto, right, government from a self-declared um, entity. And, um, you know, the, the demographics and the, situ- and the situation in Kosovo um, by itself generally lend towards the thinking that such an outcome for a secession from Serbia would be a, a legitimate outcome, right? So um, the, the issues that we talk about in terms of neocolonialism um, and imperialism are that they're able to reach into regions and, um, you know, use a, a rules-based system uh, that they create to adjudicate, you know, which, you know, of these they will recognize and which they won't. And by them doing so, they find legitimacy. And this is uh, different from self-arising uh, situations where you also would have perhaps like a, a powerful adjacent state um, that can support it and has a demonstrated interest in its success. One of the problems, we're just talking about the practical considerations in diplomacy and international affairs that go behind, you know, sort of the adjudicating process and whether you have it before you the possibility of a viable state, right? Mm-hmm. Because just because you have a, 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 a referendum doesn't mean that you have the agreements with water, with resources, that you're going to have enough technical development, employment, agriculture, like all of these things have to be sorted, right? And um, interestingly, through all of this, um, Serbia's response has not been really one of trying to cut them off. That would create a catastrophe. And that's precisely the point, because the sort of adjacent state to, to Kosovo is Albania, and um, they're uh, in very big, deep trouble demographically, uh, economically, their debt, their relationship to the EU as a vassal state. And so um, they, they, the EU is basically um, has to be the, the guarantor of the success of this part of, uh, of Serbia, this Kosovo part, or we can call it Kosovo. Um, but another issue is that because um, Serbia continues to provide uh, resources, citizenship to the people of this region, those people are, you know, the thing is that the, the truth and the, when we sort of to connect these two dots, so Serbia and Belgrade is kind of more like the economic stronger unit out of this, right? So if you didn't have sort of a, an unnatural f- kind of foreign interference, regionally speaking, um, playing into the divide and conquer micropolitics, these states by their own volition wouldn't have come into being, wouldn't have seceded. And because historically they don't have the foundations to succeed as states. Mm-hmm. And you can't, you can't put those like on life support or just you know, wish those into existence. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, sort of like uh, Iraqi Kurdistan comes to mind. You know, they've had referendums, but their their neighbors don't recognize them as a as an independent state. So, and they're missing a lot of things that are, you know, quite frankly, needed to be a viable state. But that that's one possible example that sort of sounds like what you're describing. 
Yeah, and the the thing is that under within Yugoslavia, Kosovo was a part of Serbia, of but a an autonomous part of Serbia in the Yugoslav Republic. So it didn't have an independent relationship with Yugoslavia. It was even part of Serbia then. And the thing is that under Tito's rule, which was most of the time, right, um, very many decades, um, you had this uh, policy that he was trying to develop in his sort of um, confrontation with Albania to create Kosovo and invite um, even my, you know, migration and people in, from Albania to, to come in um, as refugees. And they were highly subsidizing and building up like issues around, you know, education, quality of life, sanitation and things like that more to like first world levels that Albania under Hoxha was, you know, running, they were building bunkers. Okay. So there was a very big difference in the sort of state capitalism or socialism or whatever you want to call it. Very big difference between socialist Yugoslavia and socialist Albania. Um, Albania kind of got behind Mao and the cultural revolution and this whole thing about revisionism and, you know, going in, in that almost wacko direction, almost like Pol Pot kind of stuff. Right. Mm. So, um, you know, that was so clearly, so, so Albania was a less powerful, less economically viable state. And so the Albanian population in, in Serbia you know, and they do are the majority, if you consider the whole thing together, you can kind of more divide up by regions and you can kind of, you know, checkerboard out some um, cordons uh, or the cantons of for the Serbs that are there. Right. But it is a it is an Albanian majority, you know, thing there. But, you know, the Albanians themselves are three different religions, two different um, language groups that don't have interintelligibility really. And. Um, and then they have differences, obviously those language and religious differences are just stark differences and they don't really consider like the Kosovo Albanians to be the same thing as that. I mean, they love them as part of greater Albania, you know, but you know, they'll, you know, most Albanians will fight for Kosovo down to the last Kosovar, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, yes. so that's the issue. And there's just sort of a, like in, in Albania they have, and in Kosovo they have statues to like Clinton both of them and, um, you know, Madeleine Albright and General Petraeus are owners of, you know, big companies. And, and in Kosovo, it's owned by American generals. I think it's Petraeus or uh, who was the one? Oh, Wes Wesley Clark, maybe. Wesley Clark. Yeah. Wesley Clark is an owner of telecom in uh, in, in Kosovo. Right. And it's just it's it's a flagrant violation of international law that way, how they how they come in. But it just operates just like the old Roman Empire with the generals and senators like Pelosi making her flight and all this stuff. Right. So, you know, it's uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, it's a very good question that you ask. And I, you know, I, I think it's like it's it can be difficult to unwind because the truth is that all of these people have certain inalienable rights. Right. And they have certain you know, there's certain desires and narratives that some of them are, are, they're all based in truth. You know what I'm saying? Lowercase, you know, self-lived truths. And that's, you're not going to confront and, you know, talk about population relocation or swapping populations in, at this day and age in the context of peace as if that's your, you know, desired goal, right? So, you know, you can't really have, you know, it's very difficult um, for people to understand that, um, the quality of life for Kosovar Albanians um, in of Serbia was a higher standard of living during the Yugoslav period than for any Albanians except the you know the ruling party of the you know the nomenklatura or whatever of the uh, Albanian regime. But with with regard to you know the uh, you know Kosovo, this was supposed to it was set up as an example of maybe even why Yugoslavia might you know. Um, administrate all of Albania. You see what I'm saying? Like, who knows what was in 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 freaking Tito's mind, right? I mean, why they what what they were doing with with the Kosovo project, and it backfired, frankly, right? You can see, but um, you know, inviting people to come and kind of building up on this, it was built into this idea that the Yugoslav socialist Yugoslavia was based on the idea that Serbs um, were the historical oppressors of all these different regional 
people. So the, so the socialist Yugoslav government, despite the military and the generals and so much of government being Serbians, they had gone through this process of sort of calling themselves Yugoslavians. So the Croatians and Macedonians and all these other people call themselves what they are, but Serbs were kind of required to call themselves Yugoslavians. Otherwise, it's kind of offensive. Like It's almost like you're, because if you're a Serbian and you live in the areas that the kingdom of Yugoslavia is, when they made those agreements, they said, okay, this is going to be Bosnia, whatever. And you say that you're Serbian, then people are like, oh, you're a great Serbian. You see what I'm saying? Because you're, there you're living in the, in the Krajina, uh, Croatia, or there you're living in, in, uh, in, in uh, Skopje, Macedonia, right? Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of pressure, weird things when the war popped off and how these games are played and everything gets manipulated today. And there's it's also the, the cultural and the, the heritage issue because just like, uh, you know, Kiev uh, is regarded by Russians as a, one of the sort of the spiritual fountains of, you know, the, the Russian world historically. Um, and Kosovo also plays a, that area plays an important part in Serbian history, doesn't it? Yes. In fact, I mean, the thing is that this is we so we always we were just talking about the 20th and the 19th century and you know there had been you know periods in recent history when kosovo was a serbian majority by the way so but in the distant past as well um you know in the 14th 15th 16th century and onward for some time you had a you know it was actually the cradle of the serbian state actually kosovo and uh you know the first serbian churches and all these things so it's been a problem and even like the UN, you know, with, with all of its problems has even recognized some of it with the destruction of, you know, some of these uh, old, uh, you know, antique things and religious uh, items and icons and stuff and locations been vandalized by or destroyed or burnt um, by radicals, you know. And, uh, you know, what drives Albanianism is Albanian nationalism. That's what unites all of these these people and the disbelief that they are Illyrians, you know, and I'm not disputing that they aren't. I'm just saying that that's also what they use in terms of the, um, they use an antiquarian uh, solution to, you know, modern uh, divisive, you know, politics of, uh, of uh, language and religion, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a very interesting survival mechanism that the Albanians have adapted. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the culture and they're beautiful people, very kind, generous people. You know what I'm saying? Like this is the reality of the world. And it's just how these governments and states have been put against each other, right? So the thing is that um, Albanians, despite having, um, despite having the possibility to live in the EU, and they have a crisis and they have an age demographic crisis because even though um, you had the Democrats like the Clintons and and you know, um, you know, thankfully, she just uh, recently passed away. Um, I mean, not thankfully, but thankfully, we can say that she's no longer going to have a negative impact. Madeleine Albright, um, you know, she her politics were very um, large in creating this foundation for Greater Albania. You know, no one, no, it's very hard for Albanians who oppose the deep state not to recognize that the deep state and the cabal were behind building up this kind of greater Albanianism. So it creates a lot of heartache and even cognitive dissonance among and, thinking people. And yeah. also Madeleine Albright was, you know, responsible for pushing this idea in America, which especially uh, among the liberal left, um, that, you know, anti-Serb kind of uh, sentiment that's very prev- was very prevalent in American uh, politics and in the media. And I think that was the backdrop of, uh, getting America to support NATO's intervention in there. And she, she's very outspoken about that, which is uh, almost ironic considering her personal family history. But, um, yeah, so she, she was responsible for a lot of that. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. They almost try to rewrite the history of like World War II or like who was on which side. Like in the 90s, they were trying to make it sound like historically the Serbs were like the, the pro-Nazi side or something. Yeah, exactly. It's a very, very bizarre distortion because that was like the opposite of the case. It was, unfortunately, there was a, a minority of Croatians that were, got behind a, a junta in Croatia and in the name of Croatian people is also a crime. Um, you know, did uh, horrible things to Serbs and and gypsies and things like this in World War II. And they had concentration camps and everything. It's not what most Croatian people are about. Like, don't get me wrong. We're just talking about World War II. It's like talking about Italians or Germans, right? Yeah. Yeah. But those are those old wounds that Americans um, are, are, 
very, um, they have a bad habit of wanting to use those as almost like very cynically as a kind of geopolitical leverage so they can use it as a cudgel against whoever that they're, you know, trying to unseat. They seem to be very skilled at this. The British do it too, but in a different way, much more subtle perhaps. But um, you know, Shiites and Sunnis, for instance, you know, Shiites bad, Sunnis good, so etc. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And, you know, one of the problems is that in the Western narrative is that, for example, like when the BBC handed over its, you know, Middle East network to, you know, the uh, Al-Thani dynasty in, in Qatar and they created Al Jazeera, a lot of, you know, because of like the beginning of Internet 2.0 and then they got some cable deals, people got Al Jazeera that was reporting some good authentic stuff about the resistance in Iraq and the crimes of some of the uh, elements of the crimes of the U.S. occupation in Iraq, right? And also some decent coverage on, or more balanced coverage, at least on um, Palestine, or at least you can get that the Palestinian take from things, right? And understand what you're seeing when you see it, but it's available there to see it. So people, so Al Jazeera had a lot of credibility, but because they're also like tied to on the other, they're actually an extension of, of, uh, of British intelligence in many ways, and it still continue to coordinate. This was, they continue to promote the NATO, um, you know, uh, 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 international community, uh, version of history about the wars in the nineties and the Balkans and the, you know, and the foundation for the whatever separatism later on. It's not so much the thing that I would want to stress is that, you know, um, all of these countries were infiltrated that are now countries were infiltrated and it, they've led to sort of a fatalism about there could never be a Yugoslavia again. And so the next one of the kind of next big um, um, synthesis moving forward is going to be the, re, you know, maybe even uh, integration with Bulgaria. But anyway, it'll be the realization um, that just that every given thing that happens doesn't mean that that's the eternal thing that has to happen for all time. Otherwise, you know, the first kingdom of Yugoslavia would have existed for all time or the, you know, anything that ceases to exist for a time doesn't mean that it's, you know, was meant to fail or would, Oh, you see what I'm saying? So there's a lot of things that so long as these different constituent parts continue to believe that there have more antipathies than common interests, then the European Union and the great powers will be able to manipulate them against each other. Yes, yes. I, I think that's Kosovo, in, in my eyes and many others, I think it exists for that purpose almost exclusively um, in the West. The story, of course, that you're painting is more realistic on the ground. So, But this, this latest um, international alarm was set last week last week um, and Serbia had to deploy um, some forces to kind of calm things down. Um, explain to us, uh, we've got a couple of minutes before the 40 minute break, but explain to us what, what took place. You know, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of agreements that are in place in Kosovo because you also have a Serbian population and they're so even though Serbia does not recognize Kosovo, they do have a, they have to talk to somebody that's in power. So they, so there is sort of this agreements that they have about how to get documents from to the Serbs that live there, how to get things to, from them, their rights to travel and things like that. That's all related to that. And so now and again, the, um, the Kosovo authority will kind of create some issue and, or they want to renegotiate the, you know, the kind of the tariffs or the fees or what documents people can get or how long it takes and their rights. Can they vote? Who counts them? All these things, access to water. There's an electric station, uh, you know, that's associated with the Serbs that the, um, you know, the Kosovo authority likes to take or whatever. So it's like this type type of thing. But the issue is that, now you have um, a, a crisis happening at the same time with Sarajevo. And you also have a, a, you know, a issue between Croatia and Bosnia, consequently, because of these same uh, Clinton Soros uh, networks operating in former Yugoslavia. So even though, you know, you saw people saw kind of like the, the tail wagging down here, like with Kosovo, you know, there was like a dog wagging that tail in Washington and other things that were wagging at the same time were in Sarajevo. And that comes back too. 
And that's about that's going to probably spark off the much bigger conflict because the Serbs right now can never, by authority of the state and its legitimacy, could never give up the claim on Kosovo. But the de facto situation um, is very hard to reverse. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. However, on on Bosnia and Republika Srpska, the de facto situation is actually what's contrary to the de jure, de jure. So you have to look at the the de jure situation, the the act, the the legal situation um, in in Bosnia as the linchpin of the crisis, and then you have the linchpin of stability in the region is Belgrade, and the one actor that keeps that maintains any kind of stability in the region is Belgrade. And, and if Belgrade, you can't really say that you control, if you're a foreign power, whether you're the Ottomans or you're the Nazis or you're the European Union, you can't really say that you control the Balkans if you don't control Belgrade. Mm-hmm. Yes. And the Republic of Serbska, that's um, attached to Bosnia. And it's it seems to me like that's drifting towards Serbia. We'll, we'll talk about that on the other side. Yeah, to Belgrade, yeah. Uh, yeah, but to Belgrade. I'm, I'm here with Joaquin Flores from the New Resistance, and we're talking about the Balkans, recent news, but also looking back at history, how we got here and where we're heading. We'll look at this more and deeper on the other side. I'm Patrick Henningsen. This is TNT, today's news talk. Stick around. We'll be right back. De-weaponizing weather with reality and perspective. The one thing I try to do is tell the truth no matter where it takes me. For instance, I've been lamenting for the past couple of months that there's been a big difference between the University of Alabama Huntsville satellite temperatures and the computer initialization temperatures. Well, no more. They are both right on top of each other at 0.36 Celsius above the running 30-year mean, which would make this the warmest July on record globally on both scales. So there's agreement. Now that may get some people mad that are saying, wait a minute, the planet's supposed to be cooling. Again, you have to understand that temperature is a third rate metric for climate. The number one item we should be verifying is increase and positioning of water vapor, and we don't do that. So I'm not afraid to tell you, yes, by temperature standards, July was warm. This is weatherbell.com meteorology. Joe Bastardi for TNT, reminding you to enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you've got. In this day and age, everybody deserves the right to access phone and internet services. Whether you're from regional, rural or remote Australia, the Regional Tech Hub can independently assist with providing advice on connectivity options in your local area or work with you and your service provider to resolve outstanding issues with phone and internet. And our service is absolutely free. Find out more by visiting regionaltechhub.org.au or by calling 1300 081 029. RTH is an initiative of the Australian Government, delivered by the NFF. Free speech is in our DNA. Experimental vaccines will never change that. Listen to TNT Radio anywhere you go. Yeah, even there. Never miss out on the news and views of the big issues of the day. Ask Alexa or Google to play TNT Radio. Or download the TNT Radio app for free from the App Store or Google Play. Today's News Talk. This is TNT Radio. All right, welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to TNT Today's News Talk. We're into the final segment of the second hour here, and I'm joined by a geopolitical analyst, uh, Joaquin Flores. Uh, His site is the New Resistance, or channel on Telegram, at New Resistance. I highly recommend it as a sort of go-to point uh, on a daily basis for news analysis and up-to-date information, especially on what's happening in Ukraine, but also on the Balkans, Europe. Europe and, and globally, and also the Great Reset uh, as well. He's joining us on the line right now. Before the break, Joaquin, we were just mentioning or getting into this issue. What, are the, what is the really crucial issue right now? We're talking about Serbia, Kosovo, uh, the, the flashpoint that w- looked like it might appear last week. But of course, you're saying this is, this, there's something bigger to consider here. Um, explain to us what, what is the Republic of Srpska? Uh, and why this is potentially really significant uh, for Belgrade. Yeah, and thanks again. Um, Absolutely. So you have, you know, Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, um, population seven or eight million, and then you have another uh, 
number of millions of people, maybe three, um, who live in another country called Serbia or uh, uh, Serbian. Um, it's the Serbian Republic, and it's it connects to Serbia. They share a large border, so to speak. It's a, basically an open border. But politically, it's just considered an autonomous republic inside of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, it being neither Bosnia nor Herzegovina, by the way. People always go, which one are they? <laughs> because there's two entities inside of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, <laughs> and one of them is called Bosnia Herzegovina. And the other one is, is the Serbian Republic. And they have had, you know, mock like government uh, uh, staged um, uh, referendum on, on joining Serbia. Um, you had like 98% of people turned out and or 80% of people turned out voting 98% in favor. Um, so that suggests maybe discouraged people stayed home, but you still have a very large, very large overwhelm, more than two thirds, right? More than 76% or whatever, what have you, a 67%. So um, that is is a very big factor. And then you have a government in Sarajevo that is trying to change the constitution to strip away any autonomy. So on the one hand, you have this you know, millions of people that want to join Serbia. And then on the other hand, you have this government in Sarajevo that wants to strip the rights of autonomy and the, of the uh, sovereign uh, military force um, from the Serbs. And then uh, the other part of this crisis right there in Sarajevo that popped up is they also want to then also the same, and this is backed by MI6 Muslim Brotherhood Networks. This is the issue. This is the problem here. Um, and um, they're hijacking um, a, a sort of semi, a, they're hijacking a, a Islam and making it like a, a tool of the West that's also with some, replace the, the role of the social Democrats or the old socialists as well. So they take concern for social justice, just like you had with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, right? Sort mm-hmm. of like in trying to create uh, dual power structures competitively with the uh, Nasserist uh, state in Egypt, right? So you have this um, Western financing and through Soros NGOs, right, through these um, non- non-governmental organizations operating there, um, a lot of changes in power, right? And that kind of led to an unnatural radicalization of the government in Sarajevo in the first place, like with um, Izet Begovic and uh, people like this, the the leadership there and they were they were fighting against the croatians too so this is this it was like a three-way fight even at times and it was just a complete mess in the 90s and none of that went away we just basically had this long talk for a while a little pause and some and all these countries petitioned to join um nato and the eu and then you have serbia which is pretending to want the eu and doesn't join and is um never going to join NATO, they've, they've said, and, uh, you know, signed that. And that creates, a, you know, them as an obstacle, you know, as in the region to NATO. It's just the long and short of it, like setting aside all the other issues, of, you know, of voting and separatism, ethnicities. At the end of the day, you have a state that's, uh, you know, poking the eye of NATO. And, and, and also that state it happens to be traditionally, historically, uh, an ally of Russia. And that's, it's a, yes, it's a historically ally of Russia. Yes. And that's sort of the, you know, the, the issue. And that kind of connects these conflicts because, um, well, you had, for example, Ukrainian military as a small part of the of the of the of the occupational force in, in um, Kosovo. You have um, you have a further uh, understanding among Western powers that they have the positional strength over the parliamentary systems and kind of electoral outcomes in Sarajevo to pull the trigger when they're ready. And Lavrov has said unconditionally already that in the event, and he said this in 2015 or 14, he said, unconditionally that in the event that Sarajevo does under this, you know, mind control, 
uh, transatlantic mind control uh, to revoke the autonomy or to infringe on the autonomy of the Serbian Republic, then um, Russia will act decisively in defense of the historically state-forming peoples. And this is this that would be the Croatians and the Serbians, um, who in history had um, were states. So, um, for because what the Bosnia Herzegovina side of Bosnia Herzegovina is actually referred to as the Muslim Croat Federation. So it's like a Muslim Catholic checkerboard state of cantons that are different areas that are, it's all really the same people. And, you know, they're all very more alike than similar, by the way, but you have some are Catholic and some are, are Muslim. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they're supposed to have power sharing. Okay. And even though Croatia as a state proper probably would also like to have some referendum that maybe they pick up, maybe have some, uh, pick up some cantons that can, are, you know, adjacent or can also, you know, maybe start to make agreements on passage to other cantons that aren't adjacent um, to make a, you know, greater Croatia. The reality is that um, Croatia's government is also part of this European Union and NATO network. And the policy has been to promote the um, Muslim Bosnian agenda in Sarajevo, even against the Croatians. So there's a lot going on here that's kind of popping off, and it so it creates a lot of dissent in Zagreb as well against NATO and the situation um, in Bosnia. And and Russia, for its part, has made it clear that it's not just going to be like we're the we're here to be um, Serbia's baseball bat, right? Like they're also going to look out for the Croatian situation as well. <laughs> and um, they're not going to try to make this be like about a NATO versus Russia thing, but about the outcome of uh, a crisis of leadership in Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. And so then you would have Serbian forces in uh, Republika Srpska and then Russian forces in Serbia. Right. Playing like support roles. Yeah. Not directly involved in the conflict. Yeah, and, and when you say um, this kind of Soros uh, reframing of, of the, at least for the Western vantage point, the Muslims in Sarajevo, you're talking about this this image of a progressive Muslim or, you know. Yes, yeah, they do this. They're, I mean, because we know that in reality, if you're there and you look at the, the electoral slates and who these bearded guys are, you know that they're, you know, extremely conservative um Salafists, effectively, they're, they're more like neo kutbists of the of the Muslim Brotherhood persuasion. But nevertheless, you get the idea. Uh, Khotob, we're talking about Khotob, the um, one of the main ideologists of, of contemporary Muslim Brotherhood thinking, because, you know, back because you, know, you had like a secret society stage and the Lawrence of Arabia stuff and all of that. But it's all connected to British intelligence networks and the anti Ottoman struggle. Right. So during the great game, 19th century stuff. So this is all like we're still living on with this stuff. That's what's so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And and so then you have this Muslim Brotherhood thing happening in Sarajevo and they're pushing this agenda while at the same time what Westerners are going to see on TV is going to be like, um, you know, um, young women like remember Femen in Ukraine, they would take their, they would be out there with their shirts off. Yes. So you're going to be the same ones. They're going to have like the, the pink manic panic, like uh, armpit hair, but they're going to be wearing uh, hijabs, you see. And they're going to be like, we're Muslims. We're, <laughs> we're being uh, suppressed by these um, Christian Western imperialists, the Serbs. Like, see, that's what they try to, they always try to make it when it's convenient in the narrative, the Serbs can either be the role of the Eastern barbarians of the Eastern Slavic horde of the Mongols in a sense, or maybe even say that they're gypsies, like in the same way people slander Romanians as saying that they're all gypsies, you know, these are these different slanderous narratives. But then when it's convenient for the, you know, Al Jazeera progressive liberal people living in the dark and getting their editorials from the Washington post and the New York times, and they think they're progressives, right. They're being fed this whole simulacrum alternate reality 
that everywhere in the world, even in like in, you know, <laughs> Muslim countries, even in the, you know, Gulf monarchies, that Muslims are suppressed, that Muslims are the minority, right? So uh, there's a failure to appreciate that the Muslims are indigenous to, for the last, you know, 500 years, let's say three, 400 years minimally, indigenous to um, this region. You know, you don't, you don't backtrack people out. You can't, you can't remove the Spanish blood from the Mexicans going back 500 years. You can't untangle people. You, you see what I'm saying? You don't go backwards. So, you know, we, while we have to look at solutions that involve the interests of all these people, first we have to look at who had the failing, you know, global economic system. Who was behind the, you know, the market crashes? Who's behind the, the, the fake currency, this, this inflationary, you know, never ending fiat currency, right? Like which side was promoting that? Which side was using all of that? You know, then who are the actors that are using, you know, uh, actual uh, like a resource based economy in terms of not a, well, all, of course, re all economies are based in resources, you know, uh, actual uh, like a resource based economy in terms of not a, well, all, of course, re all economies are based in resources. In reality, not the, they're not overly financialized or living in a fictional, they're not, they're, the value of their currency is not connected to that, right? So you just have actually very two different things happening and that's why Albania has a crisis. That's why Albanians want to move to, um, you know, want to move to Montenegro, they want to move to Macedonia, they want to move to Serbia. That's why, because they've, the same Clinton people and, you know, we're talking about Kissinger and all these people intentionally are, have been inflating this greater Albania project on the one hand and then inflating the Muslim Brotherhood, totally different network, but they can get them to work together potentially, totally different network, okay, uh, in Sarajevo, you know, through the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Albanian thing is actually, there's even Vatican help because they have to work it through the Cala Calabrian mafia because the Albanian side of the Calabrian mafia are the Catholic Albanians. You, if you meet an Albanian who like kind of pretends he's like, oh, he's like a, uh, you know, a, a Italian mafia, well, they could be Muslim too, I'm just saying, but there's, there's connection. I mean, you have a lot of Albanians. There's maybe even a time when Italy was Albanian, well, you know, Southern Italy in the, the South, the, uh, you know, east of Italy was Albanian people. We don't know, right? Because they could have, you know, the language, there seems to be like a proto-European language, fascinating history, beautiful people. They're being used by the Western powers to be like a battering ram against perceived Russian interests in the Balkans, mm -hmm. right? And that's the crisis. Same thing with Ukraine. And and the same thing with the, um, the Muslim Bosnians and the Sarajevo government that they are threatening now to provoke an immediate and promised red line response from Moscow on Belgrade uh, as a referendum on the direction of Belgrade and that forcing that type of military or, or, or political crisis referendum on the West Balkans, mind you, has been the flashpoint for multiple world wars in the 20th century. So, so you have these smaller states, they're inherently weak um, in their formation. They require uh, assistance from bigger Western powers, and then used as a battering ram. The the Baltic states come to mind. Uh, certainly, Kosovo comes to mind. Uh, Albania comes to mind. Bosnia Herzegovina. All these different configurations. Ukraine is is a is a version of this. At least it is right now. And and in the Middle East, there's there's all, all tons of examples uh, of this. But I, I do see a kind of pattern that's pretty undeniable. Yes, it's a very, it's, what you have is um, people, they are legitimately people that are, must be afforded certain inalienable rights against the overall tendency that in a direct democracy, they could be voted out of existence, right? Because they're a minority, right? Like we vote that you must kill yourselves, right? So they must be protected s specifically from the outcomes of democratic processes as a minority, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that makes them a special protected people. In, in any place that there are, people are a minority. The issue is not that you can't have minorities, that you recognize the potential for them to be alienated or disenfranchised. The problem is that that's not the foundation alone for them to be an independent state. There's all these other factors, and that's why the majority now of countries, even at the level of the UN General Assembly, don't recognize, um, don't recognize Kosovo. So this has been an ongoing problem, you know, now, and 
it's it's not that the the process of their referendum was illegal or something. Clearly, it's always illegal to to to, to secede from something. I, I think that's fair to secede and have a referendum. Frankly, the issue to me is not that if I'm consistent with my sense of things, right? The issue for me and how I think you apply and what countries look at is viability and then the the, the, the immediate historical questions. Um, what is the successor state? So, so Serbia is, the, is really the successor state for Yugoslavia, despite all the madness that we talked about. And, and so we're, we're, we're going who, 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 to yeah. have to wrap it up because we're at the top oh, of the hour. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But, but that's the, you know, that's the complexity of it. So, you know, I, I, I thank you for the, you know, for the platform and uh, it's a uh, new resistance on Telegram. Um, that's where I'm at with it. Um, everywhere else I'm, I'm working, you know, behind the scenes. No, no, great, uh, great channel. It's something everyone should subscribe to. Joaquin Flores, appreciate your time today. Thanks. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen. That's Joaquin Flores, New Resistance. Stick around after the top of the hour news break, and we will connect with Basil Valentine for the headlines and other big stories. I'm Patrick Henningsen. We'll be right back. <laughs>